meeting. The first item on our agenda is roll call. Commissioner Height. Present. Commissioner Teta. Here. Commissioner Poland. Here. Commissioner Shernick. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Here. Commissioner Flagg. Here. Commissioner Onoran. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. All right, next is uh, communications from uh, who's, uh, from right. Brian Schumacher, our principal planner. Uh, commissioners, I have nothing additional aside from what you have in the desk already. Okay, thank you. Um, next is our public invited to be heard. This is for anything that is not on tonight's agenda. If you'd like to speak to the commission, we would love to hear from you. You get five minutes. Um, no, that's a construction mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jane. Um, okay, so uh, we do have two people signed up for items that are not on the agenda tonight, uh, Ruby Bowman, Bowman and Chris Boardman. Um, was that a mistake, or are you speaking well, I, about the agenda? I have items? some comments that I originally was going to say, and I want to say them. I don't want to run out of time. Is it is room. it about is an it item about that is on tonight's but agenda? I have additional comments that I want to say in the public hearings for my extended time. Okay, this is only for items that are on that are not on the agenda. So uh, so I'll wait to call you uh, until we're <coughs> into the actual public okay. hearing. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Boardman. Same here. Same thing. Okay. Anybody else uh, from the public who'd like to speak about something that's not on the agenda tonight? Seeing no one, we'll uh, close the public invited to be heard. Next is approval of our Janu January 15, 2020 regular meeting minutes. Any discussion? I'll move, uh, move to approve the January 15, 2020 regular meeting minutes. Okay, so we have a motion to approve the January 15. I'll second. Meeting, a second from Commissioner Tedder. The motion to approve was Commissioner Pauling. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, Commissioner Gold Goldberg and Commissioner Height abstain. Um, so the next is a public hearing item, uh, number six on our agenda, which is River Set Annexation, PZR 2020-2, with Principal Planner Good evening, Commissioners. Um, all right, so diving into this project, uh, just to give you some background, um, this is at the northeast corner of Boston Avenue and Sunset Street right here. It's approximately six acres. It's currently in Boulder, unincorpor unincorporated Boulder County Zone General Industrial. Uh, it's adjacent to, I'm trying to get my mouse going here. It's adjacent to the St. Vrain Creek here on the east side. Um, in the Envision at Longmont Comprehensive Plan, this property uh, has a land use designation is mixed use employment um, and they are requesting uh, the same zoning mixed use employment um, the properties to the south and the west sorry my mouse is funky here uh, over here are zone primary employment these uh, these lots here are all in, in city of Longmont limits uh, the property east of the creek over here, also in city limits, that zoned mixed use employment. That's the left hand brewing company. Um, and then the properties north and uh, west up here uh, are in unincorporated Boulder County. These two lots are not in this city. This is lofts in construction. Um, and so this is the applicant's concept plan. Uh, as you can see, there's no specific site development at this time. Um, this is common with annexation applications where uh, they'd like to bring the property in, but they aren't, um, they haven't nailed down a project yet, uh, but they know that they're going to zone it consistent with its <coughs> land use category in the comprehensive plan. That's the case here. Um, so they're trying to annex it. My mouse is. Eva, can, not can sure. you pause just a second? Sure. Um, Okay, Ava, take off again. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so once again, they're, they're requesting to zone this property mixed use employment. Um, some of the allowable uses that could be allowed on this property if it's annexed uh, are manufacturing, office storage, flex space, uh, some commercial and restaurant. 
uh, live work units as a secondary use, meaning there would have to be some other primary use associated with it. It couldn't all be live work. Uh, high density residential, same thing, secondary use, and potentially a hotel as a secondary use. Uh, while the concept plan doesn't have a site specific plan on it, uh, with a project, uh, their traffic study indicated, or it's contemplating, uh, for about 25,000 square feet of office flex space with 23 live work units. Uh, so that's how they based the traffic study. Um, just some background on the site, a couple things. Um, as you saw, the, the, the property owner will be required to dedicate land for channel widening for the resilient St. Brain flood control project that's going on right, right next to it. We have Josh Sherman from Public Works Engineering. <coughs> he's the project manager for that, and um, he's available to answer any questions about that channel widening project. Um, but we, in your packet, there was um, a there was a graphic from the Army Corps of Engineers that kind of shows uh, on the east side of the property where uh, we would need a land dedication. So. Um, it, we put it in a draft annexation agreement. It's not available for public view yet. It's still in the attorney's offices, but um, that is something that staff is, would require as part of the annexation, um, well, as the agreement. And so this would, uh, this land dedication would occur upon a development application. So when they plat the property, they would give us the, the land dedication at that point. Um, some environmental background, um, it was in your packets, but there was a phase one and a phase two environmental site assessment on this property. Uh, the phase one talked about some anecdotal reports about this possibly being a formal gravel, former gravel mine and possibly formerly a landfill. Uh, the report went on to say that they could find no state permits or records of this being either of those. Uh, and furthermore, um, the Phase one report <coughs> did soil sampling and said that they found uh, no materials that would be consistent with uh, landfill. We do know that the property to the south of this on Boston, the Colorado Materials uh, Landscape Company, uh, that, that was previously a landfill, um, but there were no records to indicate this uh, on this parcel. Um, I know that, um, well, we'll go forward uh, in a minute, but I know there were some comments uh, about um, an Army Corps study related to the Resilient St. Brain Project that may have alluded to this being a landfill, uh, but what I put on your dais tonight was a confirmation from the Army Corps that that was erroneous information that's going to be taken out of the report, and um, it was not, there's nothing to substantiate that it was ever a landfill. Um, there was, there's some storage areas on the back of the property, I guess up on the north side, uh, and in the phase one report it said one of the storage areas um, stored pesticides and uh, another uh, leasing space, if you will, uh, they did vehicle repair. Uh, so the phase two uh, did some soil and water samples to check if there were any uh, pesticide or petroleum contamination. Um, there were none in the deep so there were some shallow where maybe some things had spilled over uh, during you know uh, something falling over but when they bored down uh, I think it was 16 feet or so it's in the report uh, they found no evidence of any contamination um, they just recommended that um, if construction dewatering is necessary for construction out here that they do some groundwater treatment um, the fire department has reviewed both reports. Um, they don't recommend any additional mitigation measures. They said this groundwater treatment is already uh, a city requirement and process through the construction process. So that would be something that we would require nevertheless. Um, there was a traffic study prepared for the annexation. Again, they kind of based their study on a potential of uh, 25,000 square feet of flex office, 23 live work. Uh, it came out to uh, approximately 497 <coughs> weekday trips and that would be at full build out of everything. Um, the current level of service at Boston and Sunset in the morning rush is currently at level of service C. Um, the traffic study said this project wouldn't it wouldn't change it, it wouldn't make it worse, and, and it wouldn't impact it regardless of whether there was development or not. It would still be a C with the development or without. But nevertheless, they said uh, if they submit a development application, 
a couple of mitigation uh, items they could do are left turn lanes on eastbound uh, Boston entering the site, which would effectively uh, widen uh, Boston uh, to have that turn lane. They didn't think a right turn deceleration lane was warranted for if you were going westbound on Boston and coming into the site. Um, these type of mitigation measures would be, that would be something that our traffic staff would look at when we when and if we get a development application if it's annexed. So at this point, that's just sort of the general guideline. Uh, and lastly, uh, there was a species and habitat report uh, prepared for the project. Although no development is proposed, it was just sort of give us a baseline. Uh, so the report says that this site, uh, as, as you've seen from the pictures, is, is kind of not pretty. And so uh, there's no habitat right now for federal or state protected species or plants. Um, the report says that the creek adjacent to this parcel doesn't have a riparian habitat suitable for species. And that there's eagles nearby, but this property doesn't have any good nesting sites. <coughs> for trees. Um, and lastly, just as a reminder, the city codes uh, require a 150 foot riparian setback from the edge of the creek. And so when and if they submit a development application, we'll be looking out for that. And that um, edge of creek would be taken from the new edge of creek after the city's uh, land dedication uh, for the creek widening. So in terms of community input, uh, we had a neighborhood meeting in August of 2018. Um, the information's in your packet. Some of the concerns that were brought up at the meeting were the lack of detail in the concept plan, um, making sure that this project, if it gets developed, is coordinated with the resilient St. Vrain or how that timing is going to work out. Uh, there was a concern from the um, Native Roots marijuana shop across the road, across and up north, uh, that's not in the city. Uh, they were concerned about uh, being forced into an enclave annexation. If this came in, um, as you know, we, we took some, uh, we took this up to council <coughs> last year. Council's not interested in um, taking properties that, that don't request to be in, so that's, that's not really much of an issue right now. Uh, there was a concern about the habitat and wildlife uh, adjacent to the creek corridor and there was some concern about stormwater runoff uh, from development. Uh, if a development application were to come in, uh, we have a very tight crew of stormwater engineers who really enforce our regulations, so that would have to be enforced uh, within any development. Uh, and there were questions about <coughs> potential residential density. Um, and then I, uh, you know, we got the application in, I sent out notices, posted signs, I didn't get any comments. Um, and then when I sent out the letters for the public hearing, I posted signs. Um, and I re did receive three letters, uh, which were forwarded to you. Uh, again, uh, concern about the lack of detail in the concept plan. Uh, concerns again about the impacts to the wildlife. Um, there's a belief that uh, this site was a landfill because of the Army Corps of Engineers report that there was like one page that was forwarded to you from a comment letter. Um, and on your dais, uh, I got confirmation, Josh Sherman is here, he's the project manager for the Resilient St. Frame. Uh, he reached out to the Army Corps uh, and asked him for more detail about the statement that was made uh, on that report about it potentially being a landfill. <coughs> And they've cleared that up and said, actually, 
we heard it third hand from a third party. It's never been corroborated, so we're going to retract that whole statement about it being a landfill from our final report. Because uh, the, re the, the sheet that you got from the report was a draft. It wasn't the final. Um, the other concerns raised, um, someone requested that we require as a condition of the annexation that they must provide the 150 foot setback with no possibility for a variance request. Um, there was a request for a, a, a conservation easement to protect the bank swallows that was in your letters. Uh, and finally, there was a request to require remediation of contaminated soil. Um, and so that's the <coughs> input we got. Um, we reviewed it against the review criteria. Uh, we put in the staff report our findings uh, on how we thought it met the review criteria. Uh, so staff's recommending uh, PZR 2022A. Um, and as far as next steps, as you know, you're a recommending body, not an approving body. So uh, after you make your recommendation, this would go up to City Council. Um, I have to take it three times. I have to do a first resolution of statutory compliance, and that's verifying that um, it meets state statutes to be annexed. Uh, the second time, and that's tentatively March 31st. And all of these, I put the asterisk. Um, that the city manager um, has to give final approval on what goes on each agenda. So the, these could be bumped, um, but these are tentative. Um, first reading of the ordinance tentatively would go April 28th because state law says you have to wait 30 days and, and 60 days from a second resolution. So um, the second resolution and then the public hearing on the ordinance is tentatively May 12th. And uh, so the applicant will come up next and do a pre their presentation, uh, and then we're, we're all happy to answer any questions. I also have Carolyn Michael. Um, she's our traffic engineer, and so if you have any questions about the traffic study, uh, we have Chris Huffer, our public works administrator, um, and then we have Captain Goldman, our fire marshal, uh, and Amy Henyon, our hazmat uh, reviewer from the fire department. So uh, really, if you have any questions about the phase one and phase two, they're um, here to answer your questions. Uh, so with that, um, unless there's anything specific for staff, I could turn it over to David. Um, let's, let's go straight into the applicant's presentation. Okay. Thank you, Ava. Mm -hmm. Stand by. <laughs> You were the E drive, I think. Right. Remember so this one? Sure. It's PowerPoint. I don't know what the other one. The other one's a PDF. Okay, hold on. I'm just gonna queue you up and then I'll get out of your way. All right. Do you just want me to just hit the buttons for you? Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Okay. Good afternoon, or evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Starnes. I'm with Riverset LLC, the applicant. So I'm pleased to be here and present our application for consideration for you guys in terms of the uh, annexation request for our six and a half acre site at Boston and Sunset. So I'm not going to regurgitate a lot of what Ava said, a lot of the information here, but just to kind of locate you. Um, you know, we've, we've owned this property since 2014. This property is one of two pieces that we own. This is a six and a half acre site at uh, of uh, Boston and, and uh, Sunset, and we also own 21 South Sunset, just north and Caddy Corner along the creek as well. And um, we're currently preparing our annexation application for that one as well, and so that will be forthcoming. So just to kind of, again, reorient you, um, it's nearly six acres, um, and this excludes the right-of-way, the Boston Avenue right-of-way, which is part of the annexation application as well, because that Boston Avenue is in the county, and so it's based on the, the you know, consideration with public works, we, we incorporated this um, right away into our application. Um, the site's currently un undeveloped. Um, Lawson uses it, rents space from us in terms of storing um, outdoor storage um, and for their trailers and masons, masonry supplies and construction equipment. So our goal is to vastly improve what, it, what is there now. Um, the existing zoning, um, as Ava mentioned, is GI in Border County, and um, uh, the proposed zoning is mixed use employment, which is the same as the land use designation, consistent with Envision Long Line. So um, our proposed co concept plan, as Ava mentioned, um, we're looking for mixed use. Primarily, um, this site is we're considering flexible um, commercial and flex space. We're also evaluating the potential for live work units. You know, it's going to depend on market viability. I know with the St. Vrain uh, corridor uh, focus area, you know, they, they are supportive of mixed uses. So this is something that we would look at. 
that we're seriously considering. We're doing a similar product down in Louisville right now as part of our DLO phase two uh, development. We think live work is, is, is attractive. It provides opportunities for someone to live and work in the same place and reduces traffic impacts. But the primary driver for this will be commercial. Um, there's a gap really in the city of Longmont in terms of high quality commercial space. You know, Longmont EDP, which is the primary business group for the city, has mentioned over and over again the lack of quality supply of commercial space for users and having to turn away businesses that can't find you know, quality space here in Longmont. And so our goal is to kind of meet that demand um, with the right type of space that's attractive today to, to, to attract tenants and users to Longmont that, based on our discussions with Longmont DP, are moving elsewhere. And then also, in terms of the existing conditions, we, you know, we expect as part of the redevelopment to vastly improve what's there now. You know, obviously we respect the St. Frank Corridor. We work you know, cooperatively with the City of Longmont and, and, and your partners in terms of improving this property, but also the public infrastructure that's associated with improving this property as well as Long Creek as well. So the main thing I want to kind of emphasize too, again, you know, Envision Longmont is a driving vision for how Longmont should build out you know, over the next 25 to 30 years. And the, our property is located within the St. Brain Creek focus area, which is one of four areas identified in the city to accommodate, that have the greatest opportunity to accommodate this future growth and demand. And so I, as far as I can tell, we're one of the first properties here that's being proposed to be developed to, within the St. Brain Creek focus area to really improve this industrial, in our mind, our property being very blighted. And so, you know, there's two major goals that they talk about, you know, in terms of in, within Envision Longmont for the St. Brain Creek focus area. One is, you know, revitalization of uses along the um, St. Brain Greenway is encouraged as improvements to the floodway are permitted and future risks are mitigated. And our project will be doing that. Secondly, the integration of high density residential uses and support, of, support services are encouraged as well as part of the mixed use employment designation to increase live work opportunities, expand housing options within the city, and leverage planned transit investment. And again, our project is will, will help, help to address that as well. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of the key goals. They were in the, the, the packet in terms of our consistency with Envision Longmont. One is goal 1.1, which was embracing a compact and efficient pattern of growth. Again, our property is an infill development. We are completely surrounded by the city of Longmont, so we're an enclave, and so we're not asking for an expansion of services outside the city limits as part of the interstate coming into the city. So we, you know, obviously hope to utilize existing infrastructure um, that's, that's already provided. Um, policy 1.1B, again, you know, our project will support the adaptive reuse and redevelopment of underutilized sites and encourage higher density infill and redevelopment. You know, the property is vastly underutilized right now. We want to really transform something into a legacy-based project that will be very much an attractor to the city. Um, another um, goal um, in terms of promoting a sustainable mix of land uses, again, we're considering the mixed use component with the commercial and flex being the primary driver, but also considering the live work option as well. Next slide. Mm -hmm. um, and then another goal is the, um, goal 2.1, 2, 2 which is integrating land use and transportation planning. So um, Boston Avenue <laughs> is along the uh, State Highway 119 BRT <laughs> corridor project that's being um, implemented or, or planned through uh, Border County and the City of Longmont and other jurisdictions. Again, we view this as something that's called transit supported development. Again, it's um, development that is infill that will emphasize pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. You know, we plan to make infrastructure improvements along Boston Avenue as part of our site plan application with this to help address those goals. <coughs> and then lastly, and I kind of mentioned this before, with Longmont EDP is, is addressing building space and infrastructure needs and other considerations of target industries in the workforce. So, you know, Longmont and the EDP group had mentioned, as I mentioned before, you know, really lack kind of high quality space. And our goal is to re you know, reinvest and provide space to really uh, address some of the goals of Longmont EDP, which is their advanced Longmont 2.0, which focuses on the target <coughs> industries, including smart manufacturing, business catalysts, um, food and beverage in industries, and then R&D. And with the flexible nature of our space, it's not going to be like a class A office space. It's something that we, could, we want to develop. It's funky, that's adaptable, and it's flexible, and it's kind of current with where the workforce environment is moving today in terms of kind of that creative space that can be co-working, that can be individual suites, but also can also be kind of community-oriented space. 
Um, and then it's, I just want to touch on it, Ken. You know, projects like this in terms of annexation are really require a public-private partnership with the, with the city and your partners. So, as I mentioned before, you know, the city, has been, this our parcel has been identified as an enclave parcel. So we're surrounded by the city. So you know, we are an active, willing applicant that we want to be annexed in. And so that's something we hope can address. And and also with our 21 acre site at 21 South Sunset, we're looking to have that annexed in as well. And so again. It, for the enclave annexation, we hope to address some of the issues that were raised by I think Brian and, and in terms of city council about wanting to be in the city. Um, you also need some of our property as part of the rezoning St. Vane property you know, project in terms of uh, the, the corridor improvement. So, you know, we agree to make available portions of the property for RCP as well as the potential right away and any, any, any easements along Boston Avenue and Sun Street Street as part of this project and rezoning St. Vane. Um, Thirdly, as I mentioned, the annexation will will be annexing in the, the Boston Avenue right away between uh, Sunset and the bridge as part of this application. Furthermore, we'll be providing upgrades to Boston and Sunset Avenue that are required as part of the site plan application in terms of infrastructure improvements. And also, we will be working with the city for the relocation of the 12-inch water main that crosses our property and a 36-inch sewer main that will be need to be relocated along uh, Boston Avenue in the bridge. So we're willing to work with the city to help accommodate that, which further opens up development you know, opportunities within our site as well. In my last slide on parting thoughts, I guess I, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we envision our redevelopment as a catalyst for reinvestment within the St. Green Creek focus area. This is the blighted area. Our property is blighted. We, we are looking to reinvest and redevelop in something that <coughs> will be a high quality to the city of Longmont. Um, it will repurpose the blighted property and, and address a growing demand for niche commercial and potential live work consistent with the Mission Longmont. And it provides an opportunity to make critical public infrastructure <coughs> in the corridor. And we look forward to working cooperatively with the City of Longmont and the partners to improve this area. So that's the extent of our formal you know, presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Starnes. Uh, does anybody on the Commission have any uh, questions that uh, require clarification at this time from either Ava or Mr. Starnes. Okay, seeing none, we will go with the uh, uh, public hearing part of, of this meeting. I, I just want to explain uh, why I was being a stickler to Ms. Bowman uh, about whether her comments were, were related to uh, this project or not. Um, if she had made her comments during the previous uh, public invited to be heard, they would not be, and, the, and they were about this project, they would not be included in the, in the public record for this project as it moves forward. So <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that if she was going to make comments about this project per se, that they'd be in the record. Um, so we do have, uh, signed up on our list, uh, Ruby Bowman. So if you'd like to, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, figuring this out. At, um, if you come a little closer here, uh, next to Jane Madrid, um, she's going to she's going to keep the time. Um, and um, oh, and I just want to say, um, I, I Heather Houston from Birch Ecology is here. She was a consultant who prepared the habitat plan. So, okay. if this is a question, say. <coughs> um, so uh, please uh, give us your name and your, your address, uh, five minutes for your comments, but we need to have everybody really speak up so that this central microphone captures you, okay? Thank you. Ruby Bowman, 1512 Left Hand Drive, Longmont. I see several problems with the Riverset annexation. It is a former Bland Hill site. It has a potential for methane to migrate from the Colorado Materials property to the river set. The annexation concept plan is incomplete and the habitat assessment report should be redone to address off-site impacts of the St. Brain River and the wildlife species that use the corridor. The commission should not recommend an approval of this annexation. Instead, your recommendation should be it needs more work. It needs more work to clean up the site prior to annexation especially considering the applicant may in the future request inclusion in an urban renewal district for its property. The consultant CTL Thompson identified a potential problem of methane gas migrating to the Colorado materials property from the Riverset site. According to guidelines for landfill gas at and near former dumps, 
the principal hazards associated with landfill gas are explosion and fire. The Colorado materials properties of former landfill that had high methane levels, and that's why a venting system was installed on the property. Migrating methane from the Colorado materials property should be looked into prior to annexation. As for the annexation concept plan, it shows nothing of what the future uses will be. I want to know what will be built on the property which is next to critical wildlife habitat of the same frame prior to annexation. I hope you understood in reading my comments how important the St. Brain River is to our fish and wildlife. The applicant should provide a detailed concept plan with the de development layout and include measures to mitigate p potential adverse impacts on the environment as code requires. Apparently, my four pages of comments were a strong statement that sent a message that the applicant needs to do more work. City staff was so unnerved by the evidence I presented with the Riverside prop property that the form that was wait was presented that the city the Riverside property was a former landfill that they had Josh Sherman, the city's resilient St. Brain project manager, contact the U.S. Corps of Engineers today to get the Corps to remove item one in the table that I referred to in my comments. The Corps complied, but I stand by my comments, especially the statement about the river set property being a former landfill. The U.S. <coughs> the United States Army Corps of Engineers official told me that they reviewed aerial photos. The Corps came, and the Corps came up came up with a conclusion that the river set property was a former landfill. It's an act of desperation <coughs> for the city to work to discredit a legitimate concern about the landfill site. I've learned through this process that as a Longmont citizen, I should hold my cards until the last minute in order to get a fair hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Uh, next on our list is Jamie Sino. Jamie Simo, 525 East 16th Avenue. According to Chapter 15.02.140 of the Longmont Land Development Code, the city may require remediation of any environmentally contaminated property in an annexation request as a condition of annexation approval. While the city may approve an annexation without remediation, it is if it determines it is in the best interest of the city, approval of an annexation shall not act as a waiver of any requirement for remediation of hazardous substances previously established. As established in the Environmental Site Assessment, ESA, provided with the annexation request, the Riverside property may have been a landfill at one time. Even if it was not used as a landfill, however, there are other factors, including potential pesticides village and other hazardous wastes, such as oil from car maintenance, that must be addressed. There are many unknowns in the ESA, and it is troubling that there is little concrete documentation of what exactly occurred on the Riverside property over the years. The city should require a thorough assessment of the site and cleanup of any and all contaminants before the property is annexed. <coughs> It also concerns me that the concept plan provided with the annexation request is very general. While the potential mixed use zoning of the property may conform to the Envision Longmont plan, how can the city determine whether the developer's vision for the property is otherwise in alignment with Envision Longmont without additional details? If Longmont wants to have smart growth, it needs to know what developers plan to put where rather than allowing for a mishmash of development. Finally, the species and habitat conservation plan that was developed for the annexation request is incomplete. In Chapter 15.05.030 of the Land Development Code, species or habitat conservation plans must include, among other things, an analysis of the potential adverse impacts of the proposed development on wildlife and wildlife habitat or on important plant species on or off-site. The conservation plan does not analyze adverse impacts of the development on off-site species or habitat. For example, the conservation plan states that the stone cat, a native fish that is on the state list of species of special concern, does not occur in St. Brain Creek, which is not true. In fact, according to Boyd Wright, a native aquatic species biologist with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the area from the Beckwith Diversion at Golden Ponds all the way to Sandstone Ranch is precisely where the stone cat exists in the St. Brain. This is corroborated by Timothy D'Amico in his 2018 thesis, Stone Cat Ecology in St. Brain Creek, Colorado. Before annexation, impacts to native fishes, including the stone cat, should be evaluated. 
In addition, the conservation plan does not mention anything about the bank swallow nesting site that exists adjacent to the Riverside property. Bank swallows are a Boulder County species of special concern, and there are only a handful of known nesting sites within Boulder County. Furthermore, they are a declining species nationwide. Current plans for the Resiliency Drain Project call for the placement of a split channel flow option right where the bank swallows nest, destroying this valuable habitat. Therefore, in addition to the required conservation easement for channel widening and construction staging for this resilient St. Brain project, I very strongly urge the city to require an additional conservation easement for placement of the split flow channel on the Riverside property in order for construction to avoid the big swallow nesting area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simo. Uh, Sherry Malloy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sherry Malloy, 2013 Rangeview Lane. I'm a member of Stand With Our St. Brain Creek. We are a growing group of community members who continue to advocate for protecting our St. Brain corridor from potentially damaging development by promoting policy and safeguards to foster riparian health and the wildlife that depends on it. 90% of all wildlife relies on riparian areas for survival. We are not anti-development. We just want it to not cause harm by being set back and being appropriate. The Longmont reach of the St. Vrain has tremendous ecological value with important natural resources. Portions of the corridor are designated as critical wildlife habitat and been identified as having immense conservation value to the state of Colorado due to the presence of rare, threatened native fish species. The entire corridor is a stream habitat connector, which is how wildlife moves from one area to another. Evidence demonstrating how wildlife moves in this corridor include mink and beaver, golden ponds, and sandstone, coyotes and foxes throughout the corridor, and bobcats and deer at sandstone. The economic benefits of protecting riparian areas are well documented. Longmont's 150-foot riparian conservation setbacks are not only essential to protecting the creek's health and the wildlife it supports, but also for protecting people, property, and infrastructure. Riparian setbacks sustain or increase property values by helping to keep community costs low, reducing infrastructure costs, and decreasing reliance on engineered solutions. The overall costs associated with the protection of riparian areas are considerably less expensive than restora restoration projects needed to repair damage from flooding. The Riverside Applications Concept Plan is very general and does not specify what development is intended to take place in terms of building, in ter intended uses, etc. This proposal see appears to fall short of what's required in the LDC Code Section 15.02.060 which indicates a concept plan shall include mitigation of potential adverse imp impacts on the environment. I say this wh because while the applicant hired Birch Ecology to complete an environmental assessment, thoroughness of the environmental impacts are not sufficient without knowing what the proposed development might entail. Before this annexation is considered, it should be stipulated that the 150-foot riparian conservation buff buffer be protected by designating this portion of the property to the City of Longmont. This property is still in the floodplain and was not developable prior to the massive public investment in flood mitigation. FEMA is not expected to change their floodplain maps for another three years. The mitigation price tag is approximately $350 million and counting. Because of our investment, the public should get something in return for the big price tag our tax dollars are covering. The Army Corps of Engineers have identified 12 flood events in this corridor in the last 120 years. Even with the best possible mitigation, mitigation efforts, common sense dictates this corridor will flood again. The lesson from the 2013 flood is give waterways space. <clears throat> it is morally and fiscally irresponsible to put people and property in harm's way. Aldo Leopold said in the early 1900s, whatever is in the floodplain belongs to the river and it's up to the river when she takes it back. This annexation application needs to be amended before being considered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malloy. Um, Heather Houston. I am uh, Heather Houston, 4401 Bella Vista Drive. I'm the ecologist from Birch Ecology who prepared the report. And I didn't have prepared remarks. Um, I just wanted to sign in uh, because I'm a resident. And this is exactly the kind of project I want to see as a resident um, and as an ecologist. I think. It's a good place to do something. I'm not uh, into the phase one side of environmental work. I'm an ecologist that focuses on plants and, and restoration ecology, but I think that um, 
for me, going out to a place like this, it is not a hard decision to think that this is the type of place where, um, given the degraded conditions and what's proposed, I'm really excited as a resident. Um, in terms of addressing some of the specific comments <coughs> on the report, uh, it said there's no habitat for stone cat because there's no water on the property. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities with this property. There's, this is not the final chance to have a say on what goes on on the property. Um, you all know that well. Uh, it's not common to have a full develop, development plan at this stage. So um, obviously I couldn't evaluate that. Uh, what I can say is the property right now is non-habitat. And so I don't think it matters a lot what you do on it because that property is not habitat. Uh, the creek itself is habitat. The section that abuts this property um, doesn't have good habitat conditions. It will after the project. But I think there's a lot of opportunities to take that buffer area. And right now, it doesn't have native trees and vegetation in it. And, and so this property can be developed and it can be landscaped with native species, cottonwoods and willows that go there. Um, there can be things done with stormwater management that could make things better than they are today. Right now we've got a lot of bare ground and uh, that's not good next to a riparian area either. And the bank is covered by crested wheatgrass and a monoculture that's a non-native grass and it doesn't have very high cover there either. And I know the bank's going to get reworked, but um, I think, you know, it's true that the St. Vrain Corridor is an important habitat and at the eastern and western edges of town, it's more important. Um, it's important to maintain it here and respect it, but the quality of what exists in this industrial part and the central part of town is not the same as what we see at the edges of town. So to me, this is a place where, like we said, it's infill. You know, the crimes against nature on this property happened a long, long time ago. It's not now. You know, this is, how can we make use of a property in a great way that benefits people that are residents along Longmont, like me? You know, I think, what can we have along this creek corridor? I'd like to live there. I'd like to have an office there. And uh, environmentally, I think, uh, in terms of the plants and, and animals, it's, it's not a concern. Thank you, Ms. Houston. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Please come forward and give us your name and address. And yeah. I'd like to hear from you. Chris Bergman. I'm at 1512 Left Hand Drive. Um, just wanted to add a little more on the Army Corps of Engineers angle. Um, what I get out of it is that they, they looked at it. They thought it was a landfill. And now at the last minute, we're hearing that they couldn't confirm that. And to me, that's not quite the same as confirming that it was not a landfill and it's pristine and it doesn't need remediation. We know it was across the street from Colorado Materials. I don't know if the street was there when there was a landfill or a dump or whatever at Colorado Materials. The whole place could have been a dump. I mean, it kind of reminds me of uh, the stories about Belmont Butte and the Boulder Weekly a few years ago where they had, turns out they had low level radiation dumped on top of the Butte in the 60s and that's still within living memory but nobody knows where it is now so I think there needs to be more work on this and possible probably environmental remediation and to determine suitable uses for this property before it should be annexed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Gordon. Uh, anybody else you'd like to speak? Please come forward if, if you want to speak about this item. <coughs> um, this is our only time to have uh, a hearing from the public on this item. Okay, seeing nobody, we will close the public hearing and we will go to discussion amongst the commission. Um, I guess we're just going to have to do this by raising hands. Uh, Commissioner Hay. Beach. Um, Ava, I was looking at the timing of different hearings. Um, I think the first one occurred in July of 2018, and the most recent one before this February 2020 hearing was in December 2018. That's 
15-ish months ago. Is there a time limitation on hearings from when this project first had its, I guess, um, it, when it was initiated or at least brought to the public um, and now to the time when it's being considered by us? So, uh, it seems like a long time. Chair Shernick um, and Commissioner, um, so we don't have anything in the code that says you uh, have to have your neighborhood meeting and you have to file your application by X date. Um, our rule of thumb is typically within six months. Uh, and then if it's been longer, we usually ask them to redo it. In this case, if you look at the packet, the neighborhood meeting was August 9th, 2018. And on the following page, it says that the application was submitted in December of 2018. So that was four months. The application for annexation. For annexation for application. In the time period, I guess you would say the whole 12 months of 2019, was a series of back and forth between the applicant and staff. And that, is, as you know, in development review, they submit their annexation materials. We send back review comments on the plans. And then it's dependent on the applicant on their time frame when they want to resubmit. And then um, we usually turn things back within 30 days. I think there was, um, there was some lag time on the applicant's end of getting things back to us and then us commenting again on stuff and then them getting stuff back to us so it did take 12 months through the process but the application was filed in a timely manner from the neighborhood meeting i do know that 1502040f says that the city i think it's the design review committee has the authority if the applicant doesn't respond within 120 day period correct to to terminate the application. that's right and so we did <coughs> do that and so then david resubmitted uh shortly thereafter this is very often the case in development review. We have dozens of projects in our system. Uh, and so um, we try and keep up with how long people are taking to resubmit. If they're taking too long, we will send them a timeout letter. And we'll say, it, you've been 120 days since we gave you comments. Uh, you need to we usually give them 14 days to resubmit. Um, David, I think you need a little extra time because they were revising the, the riparian corridor report. So. Um, when someone's making a good faith effort and they say, no, I'm on and I just need, my consultant needs a little more time, uh, we'll work with you, we'll be flexible. And so um, it could take 12 months to get through the process. Okay. Uh, next question I have for you, Eva, Eva I'm sorry. Um, the concept plan, there were comments from um, the public as well as, well, I have my own comments. The concept plan has two definitional provisions that I see, um, 1502060, requires that for any major development plan, you have to have a concept plan. Um, but we also have a definitional section at the end of the land use code that defines what a concept plan is. Um, and it seems to be a bit more detailed than the thing we're looking at here. Um, in particular, with respect to identifying the land use <coughs> development densities um, in relationship with other properties, um, <coughs> utility systems and transportation systems. I guess we've heard that there are utility system capabilities um, that the city can, can meet for this particular property. And we've seen Boston Avenue, um, possible BRT route, and some bike lane issues. But does staff have any concern regarding the, <coughs> the open, uh, kind of not a lot of concern, but is, would you like to see more? Uh, Chair Sharna, Commissioner Height. Um, of course, staff always likes to see more. It's not required, and I will tell you that this is very consistent with a lot of annexations that come in, uh, where they'd like to bring the property in, and um, they don't have a um, they don't have a tenant or a buyer or a specific project, but they know they want to bring it in, get it zoned consistent with our comprehensive plan, and then start fine tuning development plans. And again, uh, if, if it's annexed and it comes in for a development application, we start this whole review process over. We would ask for a fresh habitat report and um, geotech report and everything that's required with development review, and we'd start the whole process again. Uh, this time, we'd have something to rebase it against and um, give it more detailed review. So this is pretty it's typical. Like I set you up as a straw man, because that's my last question. Um, the environmental reports 
the, and I'll admit to everybody, um, in the earlier part of my life for 20 years, that's what I did was review environmental reports um, to advise banks and lenders and purchasers of property. Um, what was happening on the environmental side of the of the issue. This is a 2014 report. Um, mm -hmm. It's six years old now, and <coughs> dovetailing into the concept plan um, in 1502060, there has to be a commitment in the concept plan to address any potential adverse environmental impacts. Um, from my review of the phase one, phase two work that was done here. Um, you know, the east side of the site um, was never investigated. It, it was never sampled. Um, the sampling that was done was on the west side of the site. The east side of the site, you know, at one once upon a time was a pond. Um, there's clearly evidence that there was fill material added to that part of the site. Um, the work that was done my humble opinion, I couldn't recommend somebody buying it. Um, but in terms of the annexation of this property from the city's perspective, I think the concept plan needs to address, A, possibly doing more investigation, but B, explicitly, to the extent that there's anything out there that hasn't been identified, and from what I can see, there hasn't been a lot of identification of all the, the environment, potential environmental issues out there. The, the applicant has to be compelled to address those issues further, um, and I don't see that. So, um, Chair Schoenig, <coughs> Commissioner Hyde, I, I can defer to the fire department with Captain Goldman and uh, Amy Hennigan from our, our hazardous materials inspector. They, um, I am not an expert on hazmat, don't claim to be, uh, so we refer those um, reports out to the fire department. They reviewed both. They found them to be satisfactory. Uh, we did ask them in writing, do you require any other mitigation measures? Um, they said no, at this time we were uh, comfortable with those reports. So are they in the hall or? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 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 he was right there. Sorry. You can stand up for <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was my cue, right? Uh, Captain Michelle Goldman, Fire Marshal. Uh, so when we review uh, environmental reports, phase one, phase two, both were done. Um, phase two by the Army Corps was done in 17. Uh, what we look at for is sufficiency. They did do taps, ground. There are vents there. Um, they did identify staining. They, this whole site was an infill project. So not just the pond you're referencing. The, mm -hmm. the entire site and probably the other one he's annexing, that's all infill pro projects. Um, when we look, and you can jump in if I'm, if I'm missing something. Um, but the phase one stated that based on the low levels of contaminants identified in groundwater under the adjoining landfill, the site is unlikely to be significantly impacted by migration of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, or metals from the former landfill or gravel pits on either side. Um, so we looked at the series of photos like the, that were referenced. Um, we also noticed they did put in uh, vents, a vent system. And Public Works identified that, I'm looking for my sheet now. Oh, it's right here. Oh, it's the yes, All right. Uh, Public Works did identify that uh, they are in EPA compliance. Um, they had air monitoring um, and air permits for those sites. So we didn't think that anything else needed to be done there. They did soil sampling. There were some stained areas that they identified that would have to be mitigated, so that would fall to the applicant as well. So we thought the assessments were thorough, uh, and we were fairly comfortable that the hazardous materials were not at levels that were over any uh, limits at the EPA or needed to be uh, reported further on. Our historical documents did not indicate that that this was This is a Amy Henyon from Longmont Fire. Sorry. We didn't have any documentation that that was a landfill on that side of Boston. The only found thing we found was the state of Colorado, a landfill was south of Boston and east of Sunset. It is not part of this annexation according to the state records. Now, this was clear back in 1960 that this landfill was closed. So if the parcels 
or the land wasn't accurately documented, I'm not sure. Um, so all of the reports with the state indicate that the landfill was south of Boston, east of Sunset, <laughs> not this property, which is north of Boston. So based on what we saw in the environmental assessments, we didn't see reason to require more testing other than when the staining part that would of course have to be mitigated which is noted in the environment so the things that were noted will have to be done by the applicant so we didn't see that anything past that with the samples that they had taken required any more action from us so we deal more of course with response and so when we look at an event we look at an environmental site assessment we're looking at reportable levels we're looking at things that could if we leave a scene of a hazmat incident, we make sure that it is mitigated and we are bound to report certain things to the EPA. So that's kind of what we look at when we read a site assessment. Have they mitigated it to levels that do not require further reporting or mitigation? And I thought they had clearly stated that. Um, I'll add more to that. I, I, my understanding of the sampling, there was only one tremendously hot sample um, out of the batch and it was for um, petroleum and diesel petroleum distillates. Again, on the west side of the site. The east side of the site, did you see any evidence of sampling in your review? There's a the sampling map, but I didn't bring it with me. It's um, in one of the, is it in the Army Corps it's report? It's in the ESA. <coughs> it's in the ESA. Shows it's where in where the they phase sampled. two report, right. It, yeah. They show where they took yeah. their right. samples from. It was all on the west side of the site. I think um, they were directed to just take samples of where the ground staining was and also the groundwater and when all those came back negative they didn't go back go further with more testing and maybe the applicant could clarify for me too my understanding was the the east side of the site is a concrete a defense guy or a concrete um i don't know if he's a flat worker yeah. i don't you know what's going on it seemed like half the site was one use do you understand that um you mean previously yeah I mean, you know, they, you know, as part of the phase one, yeah, there was like 12, 14, I mean, I mean, Which, it, it, 19 on the, yeah. on the west side. Yeah. I had to review that one again. Okay. Because on the east plant? side of the plant, yeah. Are you talking about the concrete plant? I'm not sure it was a concrete plant, but he was a concrete worker. And it's on the other side of the creek? Nope, it's on this side. Okay. It's the only concrete there. plant I see. That was basically the creek. Yeah. And he had large above ground storage tanks of some kind of caustic acid that they, they used to Something cure says concrete. concrete plant on a map and but it's, it's on the other side east of the creek. Of the creek. I, yeah, I'm not talking about concrete plant. Okay. Concrete work. Um, I'll, I'll shift gears and talk about the methane because as I understood the report, the Colorado material site to the south, um, that was a landfill and they, the phase one investigation talked to the people who had looked at that site and elected or constructed a methane recovery system. Um, methane, you mean? Or? It was a methane recovery system because it was high for methane. On the, south, on the site immediately to the south with groundwater and migration to the north to this site. Um, the phase two report specifically did not look at methane um, on this site. Does that cause any concern for you? I'm not sure. They did not look into that further, and I forget why he said. So as far as the, the venting system that's there is pretty <coughs> far south. I know there's vents there. Uh, as far as methane goes, they what they talk about, uh, Unclear whether the landfill venting system has eliminated the presence of methane. That's came from the phase one. Is that right? That's, That's what we're right talking about. Yep. Um, in the subsurface, it may be migrating toward the site based on the potential for methane to migrate onto the site. The adjoining former landfill is considered reportable or reportable. Is that what you're saying? That was in the phase one. Right. And then the phase two did not say they did further testing on that, right? That yeah. specifically did not. Look at Correct. That. Correct. Right. Does that cause you any concern? Um, no, because I looked when I looked at the EPA reports, there was nothing that was out of their levels. So they have to they would have to report that, and the vents would have to be reported there also. So I thought with the EPA um, results, I was comfortable with what they had done. Okay. Um, 
to conclude by dominating the rap, Jack, um, for, the, for the applicant, would you be willing to agree, <coughs> to, though it's not in the um, recommendations right now, that to the extent there are environmental <coughs> concerns that you discover on site, you'll take care of them? Yes. And the EPA side I'm talking about is compliance data. They are required to report those things. So they're, they were in compliance, and the EPA report showed nothing that was above or abnormal levels. So I was comfortable at that point. In reviewing the, the methane Correct. treatment on the south site? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner Slick. Thank you. Avon, I had some questions on the zoning. So although I'm looking at uh, the Riverside annexation and vicinity map and of course it's in concept because I don't have any dimensions on this but just for the sake of discussion on that eastern edge if one were to look at the 150 foot riparian setback that would be measured from the property line correct after dedication. After right. dedication. Yes, because if it comes in and, and uh, they want to develop, they'll have to plat the property. And at that time, uh, we'll require the land dedication. So then right. after you've planted the property, then there are setbacks that apply to the zoning, correct? Correct. And if you can think of possibly the most liberal zoning use that could happen that property after, if it should then be annexed, what would be the setback from that 150 feet after it's applied? Could be five feet, 10 feet? Would there be buffering required? It depends on the use. In a lot of uh, industrial-ish zones, um, there is no setback, building setback, to set, building setback except a landscape buffer. If you have a parking area, it's like a 10-foot landscape buffer. Okay. In and the 150 foot setback, that all has to be landscaped though. And what kind of landscape would that have to be in that 150 foot buffer back from the edge of the... Uh, whatever is in our, in our development code for landscaping standards. Okay, so this is as measured from the river. Just refresh my memory. Where is that measurement started there along the river? Um, let's, hold on, I'm grabbing my code here because um, I want to be precise where that setback comes from. It used to be top of bank. I just want to make sure that's still there <coughs> in the code. Yeah, Ava, it's still there. It's, it's, it's either, I'm sorry, Brian it's either from, from riparian, edge of riparian vegetation or if there's the not a great vegetation there. Which is further away. I guess it's the, the greater of the two distances, plus the 150 feet to where any development could occur from the site. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as you're, as somebody's getting ready, ready to um, develop it, if in fact council approves the annexation, what would be the next step? after everything's approved, if it does get If it approved. was annexed. Mm -hmm. What would be the next step for the uh, And Then it's up to the applicant to decide how they want to develop it, come up with a site plan. Um, and that would go through well, the DRC? Well, a plan and a site plan. Um, and that, yeah, that would go through the DRC. Um, and if for any reason they uh, couldn't meet the 150 feet, um, City Council has changed the regulation, so you would be a recommending body on variance, not a final decision maker, and uh, Council would make the final decision on whether to grant uh, the setback variance if, if one is requested. And it would have to go through our SES sustainability evaluation system, evaluation system <laughs> um, where we have this checklist and it has to prove up the merits of the case of, of why uh, that would, would be an that, appropriate yeah. thing to do. Right. And they'd mm -hmm. have to plead their case before us for a recommendation. And then and council has a final decision on right. that. And that has to all be done before they can basically run the site plan through to approval. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Eva, um, you mentioned something about this before, but I just want to get it clear in my head. Um, so we have these uh, environmental statements from 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. 
it's been plenty of time that's passed. Uh, so my concern is that these, these reports are relatively old. Um, but I think you said something previously that um, uh, if the applicant uh, goes forward with a, uh, with a site plan application uh, and they go in front of DRC, that another environmental statement or no, another environmental study has to be done. For sure, a right? species and habitat report and a okay. geotech report, maybe not another phase one and phase two. Uh, on the timing of that, you know, as David mentioned, they acquired the property in 2014. That's, that's right. when the, that was done. Um, remember that before they even started this whole process and did the neighborhood meeting in 2018, they had to go to council for a referral. I think we did that in 2017. 2016 so it's been a long time I did that but I don't remember how many years ago it was so just keep in mind that that report was fresher when they started through this whole process okay. and as a as a team of our city staff when they submitted their formal application we took into context that nothing's changed on the property since 2014 um, we've been observing it over the years and there's been you know nothing significant that would warrant us to say you need to go back and do more soil samples because we saw x activity going on in the last couple years since that report was done nothing has happened differently on that so uh and so we started this down this process i think 2016 with the annexation referral to council so at that time that report was fresh and it just kind of stayed with the application materials okay so um you just said something uh so the use of the site now, in my understanding, is that it's being rented to Lawson Construction, uh, or a portion of it is, and that they're storing some equipment. Um, have there been observations made by staff uh, uh, to see whether that has actually changed uh, the conditions? I mean, what if they have like a truck there that's just like oozing oil? Um, you know, do we know, because there's been a change in who it's being rented to, are we sure that there has not been a substantive change in terms of what's happening on that land? In terms of I can say uh, no one has been going out and inspecting through the years uh, the site and the soil to see if anything has been spilled out there. Um, we do know it's been storage of one form or another for contractors. Uh, vehicle maintenance and, and so landscapers and so forth so it's consistently been that type of land use okay. Okay. sure sure tell Ava um, the uh, you mentioned the industrial ish um, use or of the area if um, the in, in the request for annexation, could the applicant have requested any other uh, zoning um, other than what we've designated in the Envision plan? And is it typical in that we designate property that is outside of the city within <coughs> our Envision so plan? Good questions. Uh, so Chair Sharon, Nick, uh, Commissioner Ted, uh, um, to answer the first question, uh, so we have our, well, I guess it's kind of going to be both. We have our comprehensive plan. We do designate land that's not in our city, uh, but it's in our municipal service area. And we do that because uh, we just want to let other property owners know if you want to annex, this is what our expectation is. If you come to our city, this is what our expectation is of how you develop this land. And, and that's set by city council, of course. It's part of the policy. Um, and so typically, it's our uh, expectation that someone who wants to annex will choose a zoning that's consistent with their land use designation. And to answer the second question, if someone wanted to come in, bring a property in, and zone it to something that's not consistent with its land use designation, they would also have to go through a comprehensive plan amendment first with city council and explain up why uh, they think that there should be a different land use designation on that property and go through that whole process. Thank you. Commissioner mm -hmm. <coughs> Ora. Right. Hi. Well, I'm going to step back and uh, look at the big picture a little bit. Uh, I personally support this 
proposal and in general I support urban growth within the corridor. If you look at the pedestrian shed, that is walking distance north, walking distance south of the whole San Brain corridor, you're going to see that there are a lot of amenities and services already provided. So in terms of the land use point, this is a very convenient place for urban growth. Now, there were a lot of environmental concerns in the uh, correspondence we received. There are a lot of good examples in the whole nation as well. An extreme example is actually Central Park and Manhattan. <coughs> a very high density urban edge facing a very diverse and well managed park which is one of the best in the whole nation in the world maybe so there are ways to provide that edge there are ways to provide density still keep the environmental and riparian corridor there were a lot of references in the correspondence to resilience and what's going to be the future you know climate change etc and so forth with that, I ask the question, if we don't encourage and allow growth within the riparian corridor or within the San Brain corridor, what are we encouraging? We're encouraging sprawl. We're encouraging growth in cornfields. Any unit that doesn't come to this particular area will go somewhere else. And that's going to have much more serious consequences in terms of the habitat conservation and our energy cons conservation. Now, in terms of the resilience, one of the very important principles is the adaptation and creating pockets of cell sufficiencies. <coughs> Building in cornfields is antithesis of that. That is why using this potential within the corridor is actually very resilient for the future. So it would be very short-sighted for us to look at certain concerns and kind of categorically reject growth within the corridor. That's my personal opinion. Commissioner Paul. Eva, <coughs> there is a concern brought up about the stone catfish. Stone catfish. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyways, it appears to me if I look at the diagram that the property does not go into the creek currently, that the applicant's property does, isn't part of the creek. So technically I guess I can see, I guess then does, if I have a question would that then go to Josh Sherman about there, what gets done when the channel gets widened with this, with this fish? <laughs> with the fish, yes. To answer your first question, yeah, the study would not, that this property uh, wouldn't involve because they don't have, like she said, there's no water. Uh, but it's, it, uh, it's close to it, so I'm just wondering, when the channel gets widened, mm -hmm. what, do, what does the city do <coughs> in regards to this stone cat fish? Um, good evening, uh, Josh Sherman, City of Longmont Public Works, Natural Resources, uh, civil engineer and, and project manager on this, uh, one of the project managers on the city is Resilience and Brain Project. Um, with regard to um, the channel cross section, if you will, for, for uh, the improvements and widening, we create, I don't have any exhibits, but we create a tiered, multiple tiered cross section, um, and it has a pilot or a low flow channel within that, that meanders through the low flow. Um, <clears throat> we've sized that low flow channel for historic base flows and tried to provide um, a depth that allows for um, <clears throat> the native aquatic habitat um, so that, for instance, maybe the water doesn't get too hot during the summer whenever we're in some of those low flow periods. Um, and so that it, um, in other areas, not specifically this reach, but um, if we need to, and we have drop structures, then we'll create fish passage through those areas so that they can migrate upstream and downstream. So those, the, the project um, has early on and continues to work with 
our own natural resources department, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, others um, with regard to um, you know, not just aquatic species, but, but all habitat through the corridor. Okay. Then I have a sec. Eva, um, who can speak towards the bait swallows and the concern that was brought up about the bait swallows in that area? Um, we have Dan Wolford from Natural Resources who might be able to answer about bank swallows. There's there was concern brought up by the public that there's bank swallows in that area, that they're, uh, I guess, a protected species. Well, they're they're a migratory species, so from that perspective, they would they are protected during their migration period of time. <coughs> a lot of that would be coordination with our engineering staff and the and the contractors for a given project make certain that none of that disturbance if they would to move in during that time that then their nests won't be disturbed so if we have the ability to move in there prior to them moving in or uh, migrating then we don't have a problem once they're here then it's hands off until they migrate likely in october and then <coughs> did this there was a uh, a study done and did the study show that there is currently these uh da -da -da -da, I'm trying to look, the big swallows was that a, was that shown in the study that they're in that area the report that i wrote yes uh no because that's not on the project site i mean there's no my study is within the red boundary mm -hmm. of the project site so I didn't look at off-site impacts. Uh, we discussed the bald eagle because it's in the corridor and it's a bird <laughs> that flies around that's not so tied. But uh, we didn't look at impacts to bank swallows that aren't on the project site. There's no habitat for them on the actual Riverside property. Okay. I don't have any questions. I do. Um, tell me about the area where the, the bank swallow is most, where its habitat mostly is. Typically what we see is a lot of the bridges that we have throughout the city and underpasses, a lot of our trails, we do get quite a few um, swallows that come in and, and nest in those sites. Um, a lot of cut banks, if you would go out to the same brain um, at Well County Road 1 and look west, you see where there's a cut bank and you see quite a few bank swallows in through there. We see quite a few swallows that are, you know, in those cut banks um, along the same drain, again, to the east of Will County Road 1. But again, on a regular basis, I mean, even our park staff has to be very cautious um, in the early spring to make certain that old nests are removed, even in our shelters where they get tucked up in quarters and do the, those kind of things. So, yeah, we see them pretty regularly throughout the city. But in terms of habitat, in the whole scheme of the larger area, say of the United States, is Colorado a prime area, or is it? I would say yes, most is definitely. It? So there are probably more bank swallows in other counties as well. I, you know, again, I'm not that expert on mm -hmm. the individual species, but as they migrate up and down, you know, I would suspect that um, along our Front Range and some of those movement corridors, you in fact have a number of swallows. Thank you. I have a question. I think you might be the right person for it. Um, remember, I think it was Ms. Malloy uh, had in her statements the question, how can an environmental assessment be made without knowing what will be built? Um, could you speak to that? Uh, certainly from that perspective, I mean, as we're looking at this being an annexation, um, we're not seeing any kind of real development going on. It's just political boundaries being shifted. Really, um, from our perspective, uh, as we looked at the habitat assessment, you know, there were issues in just identification of species. It wasn't a big concern. Now, as a development plan comes in and looking at what, the, you know, what's going on, and especially in that riparian corridor, um, what the intentions are, then we might have more significant concerns. But at this point in time, this is really more of an awareness, you know, for our perspective. We know generally what that property is being zoned as, 
So based on those, I think you know we've got at least enough information to believe that we have a sense of, of what's going to happen. Okay. All right. Commissioner Goldberg. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank the rest of the commission for slowly striking off all of my questions that I had listed. <laughs> uh, so with that, then I guess I'd like to just revisit a couple of the key concerns that we heard uh, in uh, the feedback from the public today. You know, maybe we can get a step closer towards um, making a decision today. Uh, Ava, I just want to be abundantly clear, and I know you said it already, that there was multiple concerns about how can we approve something before we see a more developed plan. Uh, but just to be abundantly clear, where we're at today with this annexation proposal and concept plan review before us, this is typical. We are we're in a normal place during annexation review, and yes, sometimes projects are, more, are further along, sometimes they're less, but th there's no red flags ways raised by the city <laughs> here for the project that we're reviewing today. Right, as Commissioner Goldberg, Goldberg, I'd say all those are accurate. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, you know, Ms. Simo and Ms. Malloy, at least those two echo those concerns. <coughs> uh, additionally, Mr. Boardman, Ms. Simo, Ms. Bowman, Ms. Malloy, just, you know, here today, echoed concerns about this being a former landfill site. Maybe, maybe not, but the reporting that we were given today from the Army Corps of Engineer, you know, our kind of governing body, if you will, said, we don't have any evidence of this being a former landfill site. Is that correct? Uh, again, Commissioner Goldberg, that's correct. And more importantly, um, they didn't do a detailed study. They, that was an anecdotal remark that they had heard that they had put in the report. We did get a phase one. They did soil samples. There was no material there consistent with the landfill uh, with their boring. Great. The rumor being that it was once a landfill, not that we did the reporting and that we got that all back today. Right. Cool. Uh, it is also like the burden falls on the developer if there's any of these tainted soil treatment, tainted soils or stains, they do need to be addressed by the developer. So um, concerns with methane might be revisited, concerns with um, soil will all need to be addressed as, and that burden <coughs> falls on the developer. Correct. Thanks. Okay. Um, there have been, I think, multiple species and habitat assessments done, and you identified, I think, and, and I'll turn to Chairman Schrenak's question as well, that there may be an opportunity for an additional um, habitat assessment as this project moves along. The feedback we've received so far suggests or confirms that there's no existing issues relating to habitat or wildlife. Let me stop there. Is that That's a question to you, question? yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that how yes, the reports have read Goldberg. so far? Yes, Commissioner Goldberg. So typically with annexations, the species and habitat reports serve as kind of a baseline of what's there. And if we don't have a site-specific plan in the concept plan, uh, then we're just saying the baseline, here's what's existing. When and if a development application were to come in, that's where they have to start uh, really digging deeper into the impacts of adjacent species uh, and making sure that those aren't being impacted. Great. Yeah, this, I mean, obviously this is a very critical issue for those of us, um, you know, who love this city so much and this town so much that protecting those habitats is really important. Um, of course, also identified in our packet was uh, there's no concern about impact to eagles, you know, some of these, right. you know, more provocative animals that, you know, um, animals that live in our, in our town. Uh, this isn't an issue, but certainly as the project moves along, we'll continue to track that. Right, um, and I would actually just say, just sorry, just to add to that is this, this could actually be better environmentally because they don't have any trees or anything out there mm -hmm. that would provide nesting, whereas if it, you know, the development plan were to come in, they'd have to have landscaping plans with trees, uh, especially adjacent to the creek, so that could provide habitat where there none, there none exists at the moment. Okay. Now, also during this discussion, I heard the applicant confirm, although it's part of the process anyways, but confirm that if any additional concern, environmental issues arise between now and development, that uh, he would own the addressing of those issues. Uh, is it also true uh, that we just highlighted some of 
some of the values that this project could bring to the table as far as serving our goals and our Envision Longmont and general comprehensive plan you know, <coughs> goals, uh, using infill, developing where, you know, developing, using infill, you know, growing, <coughs> um, and then also uh, providing uh, creative, unique living spaces, workspaces, and really just addressing some of the goals that came out of the Envision Longmont plan. So I think maybe I'll stop there and just kind of flip it back to the rest of the commission. Um, at this time, um, given there's, uh, we've addressed some of the concerns raised by the public, we've addressed anything, any issues raised by the, by the city in reviewing the packet, and given the fact that the city's recommendation is to approve it, uh, I'm leaning favorably towards approving it, so I guess looking to see any feedback from the rest of the commission. Commissioner, there's no I, I, I have a question uh, to Commissioner Goldberg's point uh, for Ava, but maybe for Josh. Uh, with regard to the dedication for widening of the creek, um, which sounds very attractive to me, if we were to deny or the council were to deny the annexation, would how would that proceed? Would that be, uh, w would that still be possible, or is this our opportunity to get the creek widened in that spot? Um, so again, Josh Sherman. Uh, so the the language that's currently in the annexation agreement is kind of very typical of what we put in annexation agreements when we know we might have an impact on a on a, on a property um, based on some master plan or other piece of information that we might have. And so um, <clears throat> it requests that they dedicate that land to the city at time of final plat or upon our request. But to, to answer your question, if they weren't coming in for annexation, we, we've already talked to them in terms, just like we've talked to all the other impacted property owners about the project to say, when we get a little further along with final design and we know what we're gonna need to do with regard to actual boundaries, we're gonna talk about acquisition of either land or permanent easements or temporary construction easements whether they're annexed or not annexed. Um, and so really it's a timing issue. If, if this annexation goes through or doesn't go through, but if it goes through, it could still take some time. And if we get to a point where we need to acquire land before that annexation is complete and we can request it, we'll talk about acquisition. If it's the other way around, then we'll just ask for the request. Um, and so we, we had to do acquisition or easements on previous <coughs> phases. And to be honest, most of the properties adjacent to the channel experienced the 2013 flood and to date we've been in a you know very fortunate situation of it's been a willing seller willing buyer situation because um you know the goals of the, of the resilient st brain project to protect this community from future flood risks um those that are at most risk are oftentimes those that are immediately adjacent to the creek thank you you're welcome related with that yes you said there's an easement option as well so if you know that <coughs> annexation is going to happen, but you need to act further uh, fast, you can create a temporary easement, right? And uh, then the you know the land is going to be delivered after the approval anyway. Um, there's there's probably a way to to work that out, but typically, <coughs> and and in this case actually, um, we have some utilities that we need to relocate ahead of any channel improvements proceeding in in this corridor. Um, if we move forward with those ahead of this annexation. We would need some easements, typically permanent easements for our utilities, um, because there's never a guarantee that they take the next step. Um, so, but the situation depends. If, if the situation were one that a temporary easement would suffice, we could potentially evaluate that. Commissioner Hyde. So, to try to put the United, um, I'm going to be in favor of this with of this proposal, this annexation, with some caveats. <coughs> Um, my first concern was the um, length of time that had passed between the initial concept and this hearing. Um, this is an annexation. We've had a robust public participation, so that concern doesn't really seem to be borne out in reality. People are paying attention to this thing. Um, the concept plan is a little thin. I, I understand that, you know, we accept the concept plans are a little thin with one caveat. Um, and that caveat gets to the fact that the environmental assessment was old. 
Um, our code requires for annexation 1502-140 um, that the applicant shall perform all necessary environmental site assessments. I don't personally deem that a secure <coughs> environmental assessment meets those requirements. Um, 1502-060 requires that a concept plan explicitly state that the applicant will mitigate any adverse impacts on the environment from the project. Um, so what I'm going to, what I'm thinking of proposing, I'm finally going to make a proposal, um, is with respect to our, our resolutions, the Part B resolution, that we approve subject to condition, the condition being that a new environmental assessment be done and that the applicant take care of any environmental conditions that are identified therein. Um, is that a motion? I'm going to open that up to discussion if everyone wants to talk about it. Or, all right, Josh, I'll just do it. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh at me. Um, I will move for approval of PZR 020, I'm sorry, PZR 2022B, um, a resolution of planning and zoning commission recommending condition approval of the river set, the river set annexation. Um, Finding that the application was um, submitted, it meets DRC review <coughs> procedures, etc. Um, but that, with respect to meeting the conditions of approval 1502.055 and 02.060.82, um, that it meets the development code with the following conditions: one, um, that an updated environmental assessment <coughs> investigation be performed, um, and two that the applicant agree that it will follow through on recommendations for testing and or remediation identified in that ESA report. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor uh, <coughs> to approve 20 PZR 2020-2B <coughs> with conditions that an updated ESA be done and that the applicant agrees uh, to uh, do testing and remediation if, if necessary. Commissioner Flynn. I'm going to second that motion because any land that's in an infill position within the city of Longmont, I would just assume that the city of Longmont has the review authority over that parcel because it's of more interest to us as the city of Longmont than it ever would be for Boulder County. So I second the motion. Commissioner Goldberg. Yeah, I'm favorable to the motion, just on the condition that um, neither one of these conditions that have been added uh, by Chairman Height are not already implied or presumed in, you know, as it reads, or based on, um, you know, existing DRC, and you know, and just existing processes. So maybe Ava, can you confirm that is it, do, is, it du is it duplicative, is it redundant to add the requirement for an, uh, a fresh environmental assessment or to add that the applicant must be willing to address the envir any environmental issues that arise? And you play with my words there for a second. Is that necessary or is it? Uh, well, it's, it's up to the, the, it's the commission's prerogative. If they, uh, I mean, we have said here and, and publicly testified, we've seen a phase one and a phase two our fire department's comfortable with it. Um, they don't recommend any further mitigation. Um, we've said we don't see any significant changes on the site that would make us want to get a more updated uh, environmental report. But it is the commission's prerogative to make recommendations to council. Um, so, yeah. The okay. <laughs> that I'll add on to that too, because respectfully what I heard and with all due respect, the fire department has looked at the reports that were provided and they didn't see anything that required additional investigation. Um, I disagree. It's a six-year-old investigation. Things have changed on the site. There's a new set of tenants, at least, or at least one new tenant. Um, and, most specifically, you know, the concept plan doesn't contain that required language to take care of any environmental impacts. Okay. Sounds good to me. Commissioner Tedder. Speaking to that, I think um, um, with, in fairness to the applicant, would at the time of a concept plan, would these uh, environmental assessments need to be done anyway 
and would their doing it now satisfy those requirements if they were necessary? In other words, would, would that um, could that take the place of some additional environmental assessment that might have to be done at the time of the presentation or the, uh, the of the concept yeah. plan, right? Or, or, or the site plan of a site plan. Is that Commissioner said? So you mean yeah? So if, if they were to come in and uh, come in for development review, uh, we would not require uh, a new phase one and phase two because they've been accepted by the fire department at time of annexation. We would require a geotech report. And dependent on the findings of the geotech report, we may require some mitigation, but that would be dependent on what's submitted to us. Thank you. And again, I'll add, it, it's one shot to get the appropriate environmental assessment and annexation now. I'd be in favor of that. Any further discussion? Okay, let's uh, let's take a vote on the motion that's in front of us. Uh, Jane, we'll just do by this hand. by hand. Um, should we do oh, we roll call it and let you know, report me that way? <laughs> <laughs> do it as the standard be counted? Yes, we, we, we could do it by roll call. Um, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it, in effect, is a roll call. It, is it easier for you that way? It doesn't matter. Okay. So, how about if. It, does it matter if we do no's first or yeas first? Nope. Okay. Sure. All right. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed. Any abstentions? So that passes unanimously. Um, and this item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you're unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear before council. Please contact the Planning Division for further information at 303-651-8330. All right, Mr. Starnes, uh, thank you very much for uh, presenting your application. Uh, Ava, thank you for uh, taking all of our questions. And thank you very much to the public. We appreciate uh, all of your feedback. It helps us make better decisions. So uh, thank you for being here on this snowy night. We do have some more items on our agenda, which we'll try to get through so that uh, our gentleman next door can start jackhammering. Um, uh, next is a final call, public invited to be heard for anything that's not on tonight's agenda. Does anybody want to speak about anything that's not on the agenda tonight? Seeing no one, we'll close the public invited to be heard. Any items from the commission? Items from, no items from the commission. Any items from the council representative Rodriguez? Uh, I just want to say that a lot of the correspondence that the commission received, the council also received and has spoken about uh, amongst ourselves to a certain extent, and that the council <coughs> was uh, definitely very interested to hear uh, what the deliberations and recommendation was from the commission, and I'll be glad to obviously uh, add some commentary to what will obviously be provided to us in our packets. And as always, thank you for your service. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. Uh, any items from Brian Schumacher, our principal planner? Mm -hmm. No? Seeing none, uh, next item on our agenda is adjournment. Thank you very much. Actually,